from the sixth chapter of Matthew as a thesis verse from the scripture you've heard in your hearing. Please look at the fourth verse and underline these words, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Brothers and sisters, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we would like to preach to you this morning briefly on the subject of secret giving. Secret giving. Brothers and sisters, I remember being a young minister, being trained in how to be a man of God, how to be a clergy person, how to be a preacher, and ultimately one day a pastor. And I remember one of my mentors teaching me that every preacher should preach about giving at least once per month. This was the advice that I was given as a minister. Now, you've been with me for eight years now. You've heard me preach Sunday after Sunday for the last eight years. And you'll notice I do not take that advice. And if you ask me why, Reverend Williams, would you not take the advice to preach about giving at least once a month, the answer is it's simple. I firmly believe folks will give financially if they are receiving spiritually. And so I don't need to continually remind them via the sermonic message to give financially. What I must do is via the sermonic message, feed them spiritually and feed them till they want no more. I believe God will bless us, has blessed us, and will continue to bless us if we are faithful and committed to teach the book. If we stay committed to the book, then I believe the finances will come. And so in that belief, it is important that you notice with me that Matthew chapter 6 is a story that appears to be about giving financially, but it actually is not. Financial giving is simply the example that Jesus uses to make a point that extends far beyond the giving of tithes and offerings. He makes such an important point here as he's moving through the Sermon on the Mount that in this Lenten season of sacrifice and giving, we want to ensure that we aren't so caught up in the money that we miss the purpose of his point. And what is the point that Jesus is making here in Matthew chapter 6? Listen to his words. He says, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. He says, beware, as if to say, be cautious, be alerted that there is danger, be on notice, open your eyes and your ears, beware that danger is on the horizon. So a reasonable person must read the text and say, danger in what, Jesus? What is so dangerous about giving? And he says the giving isn't what's dangerous. Here it is. What's dangerous is practicing your piety before people. Practicing your piety in this particular text. Piety is your religiosity. It is your reverence. It is your righteousness. In very simple terms, Jesus is telling you, for the remainder of your days on the planet, don't perform for the people. Don't perform for the applause or the adoration. Don't do whatever it is that God is calling you to do. Don't do it for respect or commendation of other people. Don't get it. Don't do it so you can get a thank you. Don't do it so people will recognize you. Don't look for your name to be in lights. Don't look for your name to be called. Don't practice your piety before people because it's dangerous. It's dangerous, he says. This is why he uses the word beware. Beware as if someone is about to trip and fall. Beware as if you are about to make a grievous mistake. Beware, he says, of practicing your piety before people. Because when you look for the performance for the people, it's dangerous. The danger is this. Jot this down in your notes. When you start practicing your piety before people, you then spiritually and mentally begin comparing the will of the people Versus the will of God. 
When you are comparing the will of the people verse is the will of God, because you are flesh, born and shapen in iniquity, Jesus knows that as soon as you begin to compare the will of the people, you will get plugged in to the will of the people. The applause will bring a smile to your face. The adoration will lift your head and your eyes. The excitement of knowing that you are appreciated, the commendation that comes from the people will be something that you begin to feed off of. And the problem with feeding off of the wrong thing is that you then begin to need it to survive a need for their commendation. You begin to need their respect. You need the applause. You need them to call your name. And something is wrong, Jesus says, when you need the voice of the people more than you need my voice, says the Lord. Jesus highlights the main point here, and he uses this highlight by using financial giving as an example. But recall here in the text that financial giving is not the main focus of the message. Jesus is not focusing on what you give. He's focusing on the motivation for your giving. He's not focused on what you're doing, but he's focused on the motivation of why you are doing it. You could be giving money in church or giving a senior a ride to the doctor, giving blankets and coats to the homeless, or giving your knowledge to a student who needs to be tutored. It doesn't matter what you are giving. Beware, he says, of doing it for the applause of the people. And why shouldn't you practice your piety before the people? A reasonable person says, if I do something nice, I deserve a thank you. Why shouldn't you practice your piety before the people? If I give to somebody else, they ought to recognize me. And why shouldn't you practice your piety before people? People need to know what I am doing. People need to be aware of what I am giving. People need to show me respect and honor and adoration for the things that I am doing. I'm doing it because God gifted me to do it. I'm doing it because because I am sacrificing on their behalf. I'm doing it to bless somebody else. Why shouldn't I practice my piety before the people? The text says, well, the reason is you have no reward from your Father in heaven. You got the praise from the people. You got the adoration and the commendation. You got the people to call your name and your name put up in lights. You got an award with your name on it and a certificate with your name on it. The people stood up and clapped for you. But the problem is you have no reward in heaven. Coincidentally, just real quick, you need to pause parenthetically and figure this out. When people stand up and clap for you, it may last for a few seconds. It may last for a few minutes, but here it is. They are going to clap for you far less than the time you will spend in heaven. So why is it that I would invest in getting a few claps down here when I could invest for getting an eternal set of claps <laughs> up there? No reward in heaven, he says. He says in the text, you get no reward in heaven, and you and I and scholars can debate. We can argue all day. Did he mean you get no reward in heaven, meaning you're not going to heaven? Or did he mean you're not no reward in heaven and mean that when you get there, you're going to be in a lesser heaven? But either way, the text makes it clear you are losing something in heaven. Here it is. To gain the applause on earth, you have to give up something in heaven heaven, to gain the claps on earth, to get the recognition on earth, to get your name called on earth, to get the thank you and the commendation and the respect that you think you so richly and rightly deserve, the text says you have to give up something in heaven. Now, you ought to be asking to yourself, what is it that I lose in heaven? Look at verse 2. Whenever you give alms, look closely, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. Here it is. Here's what you're giving up. Jesus says they have received their reward. The blessing of your gift, the blessing of obeying the will of God, the blessing of doing whatever it is God laid on your heart to do, the blessing of sacrificing and giving to someone else. Jesus says your reward is just that, just that little clap that you got, that little tired, sad certificate that is going to decay in 50 years. That's all your reward is going to be. Your name and lights, you know, the lights that started bright and then went dim, your name, that's all you get. The pastor picking up the microphone and calling your name, and it probably only took me five seconds to say your name. That's all you get. You have received your reward. 
the fleeting moment of others' praise is all you are going to get. Nothing lasts, and here's why. When it comes to people, there is nothing that can last because people don't last. If they said, Hosanna one moment on Jesus' name and crucify him the next, don't you know that if the people will give you respect and adoration on Monday, they will forget about you and be respecting and adoring somebody else by Tuesday. The people don't know how to remember to say your name in eternity because the people aren't going to be around in eternity. That fleeting moment that the people can give you, the thing that makes your heart flutter, the thing that makes your ego get bigger, the thing that makes you feel like I'm truly respected and adored here on earth, it doesn't last. Jesus is trying for oh, his whole life to come down here on earth. He spent his entire life trying to get you and I to stop investing in things that don't last this earth and the flesh. To divest from those things and to invest in the things that last forever. During this Lenten season, brothers and sisters, part of your fast and part of my fast needs to be this idea of secret giving. We need to recognize the spots and places, the areas and ways in our lives that you and I have invested in the adoration of the people, the respect of the people. What is it that you need from the people? What do you have to hear from the people? How do the people have to call your name? How do the people have to write your name? How do the people have to say your name? How do the people have to put respect on your name? What is it you need from the people. Because whenever you and I get caught up in practicing our piety before the people, we are giving up something in heaven. Here it is. Jesus would never take an important time that he had on the Sermon on the Mount, the most important sermon ever preached. He would never take time to make a point if that point were true. Everybody from the pastor to the pews, everybody from inside the church to outside the church, everybody from the Christian to the Muslim to the Jew, everybody from the male to the female, everybody from the tall to the short, everybody from the black to the white, we all get caught up practicing our piety before the people. You might practice your piety so your spouse will respect you. You might practice your piety so your children will honor you. You might practice your piety so your pastor will call your name. You might practice your piety so your supervisor will remember you. You might practice your piety so somebody in your family will respect you. But it doesn't matter who you do or why you do it. All that matters is Jesus said, beware. Beware whatever you need from your spouse or your child, whatever you need from your pastor or your employer, whatever you need from your family member or your community member, whatever you need, whatever you get down here, you're giving up in heaven. Rather than do that, he offers an alternative. Look at verse 3. He says, but when you give alms, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret. This is, this is strange, Jesus. You want me to give. And the example you're using is financially, but the example is based upon the idea of giving. So you want me to do for somebody else. You want me to sacrifice for my neighbor. You want me to give, but you don't even want my left hand to know what my right hand is doing. Do you know what that must mean? If your left hand can't know what your right hand is doing, that means God only wants you to do what God has called you to do, and nobody has to know what God has called you to do. You do not need to make an announcement. You do not need to send an email. You do not need to work it into every conversation that you have. You do not need to remind us of where you've been or who you are speaking to or what you've done. You do not need to tell everybody everything that you have done in any time, anyhow. All you need to do is recognize that if your left hand and your right hand don't know what's going on, the only person who needs to know what God has called you to do is God Almighty. God may have called you to give money to somebody. God may have called you to pick up the phone and call somebody. God may have called you to write a letter and give it to somebody. God may have called you to write a meal and feed somebody. God may have called you to take somebody to the doctor and heal somebody. God may have called you to get on your knees and pray for somebody. God may have called you to sing a song to lift somebody up. God may have called you to smile at somebody. God may have called you to hold somebody. God may have called you to care for somebody. It doesn't matter how you've been called to give. All the text says is that your giving should be done in secret. Well, if my right hand and my left hand won't know what's going on. Who will know that I took so-and-so to the doctor? If my right hand and my left hand don't know, who will know that I gave some money to somebody else? If my right hand and my left hand don't know, who will know that I raided my closet and gave blankets to the homeless? If my right hand and my left hand don't know, who will know that I let somebody stay in my home when they got evicted? Who will know what I have done? 
Verse 4, part B says, And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Watch this. This is such important in the text. He says, your father who sees in secret. And so a reasonable person ought to ask yourself, why in the world is God watching me in secret? Here it is, because God is not watching you with his eyes to your external behavior. God is watching you from his spirit to your spirit. What's going on with God watching you goes on in secret because nobody knows what's really going on in your spirit. Nobody knows the true motivation for why you've done the things you've done. Nobody knows what's truly going on on the inside of you. But your father who sees in secret, your, your father who knows that it can't be seen or recognized by others, your, your father who knows that no one else will know the true motivation for why you've done what you've done, your father who recognizes what's really going on on the inside of you, your father who knows you might have done the right thing for the wrong reasons or you might have done the wrong thing for the right reasons, your father who sees in secret. Listen, you can fool some of the people some of the time, and you cannot fool me all the time, but you can never fool your God who sees in secret. In other words, Jesus is saying for the remainder of your life, everything that you do for God, remember your audience of one and cater to him. Recognition is nice. A thank you is nice. Commendation is nice. But let them be just that nice. Don't require them because Jesus did not require them for you. I, I want to remind you that Jesus came through 42 generations and never needed you to come back and say thank you. I, I want to remind you that Jesus sweat in this heat and he shivered in this cold and he didn't need you to call his name. I, I want to remind you that Jesus healed the sick and gave sight to the blind and never wanted you to come back and say thank you for what he did. I want to remind you that Jesus walked all the way up Golgotha's rugged hill. Uh, he carried a cross that had your name on it, and he never showed back up at your house to get compensation for services rendered. I want to remind you that Jesus was hung on that cross. They lifted him high, and they stretched him wide, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, why has thou forsaken me? And when he thought God had lifted him, he looked around for you, and you and I were nowhere near the cross, and he still stayed on that cross. I want to remind you that Jesus died on Good Friday. Uh, he died for your sins and for mine. I want to remind you that Jesus died for the things that you do right and the things that you do wrong. He died because you and I needed our sins forgiven. He died because we needed to be reconciled back into relationship with God. Uh, he died because we couldn't get right on our own. Uh, I want to remind you that he died. Uh, he didn't just stay dead Friday. He didn't just stay dead Saturday. Uh, he was dead long enough that you could have said thank you and you never did. Uh, you could have said I appreciate it and you never did. Uh, you and I could have stopped sinning and we never did. Uh, but but he stayed dead anyhow. Uh, and then early on Sunday morning, uh, with all power in heaven and earth in his hands, uh, he got up and went up to heaven. Uh, on his way, the Bible does not say he got a reward. Uh, on his way, the Bible does not say the angels called his name. Uh, on his way, the Bible does not say he got a certificate. Uh, but he saved your soul uh, because you were worth saving. Uh, he saved your soul uh, because you were worth creating. Uh, he saved your soul uh, because you are a child of God. Uh, and if Jesus can save your soul, uh, then why can't you give back just because of who God is? Secret giving. Secret giving. In this Lenten season, as we fast and sacrifice, let us move forward in all that God has called us to do, but let us move forward shh, secretly. God bless you, Providence.